very lucky to have a place like this. Yeah, man. Even though he doesn't know where he is, eh? You know, it's comfort for us just to know he's at home, really. He's exactly where he'd want to be. He wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So he's here with his whānau on his whenua. 24-7, always somebody that loves him. Constantly with him? Yeah, constantly with him. Jim Kingy has had dementia for six years. <laughs> his 30-year-old grandson, James, cares for him at home in Thames. Do you usually hold hands when you're with him? Yeah, yeah, majority of the time, eh, if I'm out and about with him, now. Nah, I think it's sort of more a comfort thing, eh? I just enjoy just holding his hand, eh, you know? Just feeling him. You That's like all. that feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you just got to make the most of every, every moment that we got. Good morning, mate. Hello. Over the past two years, he's shared their many heartfelt stories with tens of thousands of TikTok followers. <laughs> got our fences going up today, finally. Looking good, eh, Jim? Yeah. No, you can't run away. Yeah. Does he always want to move? Ah, he's always on the go. Just busy, busy, busy. Yeah. He moves with intention, eh? When you look at him and you watch him, he looks like he has purpose, he has direction, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And what sort of granddad was he before dementia? Ah, he was a hands-on granddad, eh? Loving, caring, just do anything for anyone. Really? Yeah. And he's good to you? Oh, he was, he was like my best mate. Well, he still yeah. is your best yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was like your like, best yeah, mate. like, you know, you treated me like I was very special to him, you know? Really? I think we're connected by Wairua now at this point, eh? You and him? Mm. <laughs> but he's just still such a happy person. I just wouldn't have it any other way. Just being here with my family, you know? All the people that I love are all under this one roof. You are? Yeah. So no nursing skills, no caring skills. I got loving skills. That's all. All my care and everything that comes from here. It doesn't need to come from a book. You can't teach me how to love my kuro in a book. If your person is sick like this, the best care for them is you. Is the ones that they love. And what was your life like before this? What, what were you doing with yourself? Before I come in and started caring for my papa, I wasn't in a good place. Really? Nah, I was, I was addicted to drugs, to mess. And you know, that dragged me away from my family completely. I wasn't in a good place. I was surrounded by darkness. And I thought that was all my life had to offer me, eh? I got a letter from Nan, and the letter said, when you come back, Papa's, Papa's not going to remember you. That sort of hit me hard, eh? And when I found out that he'd forgotten me, I wanted to be back here to say, no, nah, I'm your moko. I'm your artist moko. I'm your, I'm your best friend that you've had since 30 years ago. Don't forget me. Oh, we have got pie for Kai. He saved my life, even though he doesn't even know it. And I'm just here to try and return the favour. It. He knew there was a better dancer in the house. <laughs> I've been dating Paul since I was 18. He's really been my best friend. And what was he like in that early time? Um, well, I thought very charming. <laughs> Everything I've gone through as an adult that was hard, I've processed with him. And all of a sudden, 
the most big major thing was happening to us and he wasn't able to discuss it with me at all because it was happening to him. Tell me where these photos are from. Yeah, sure. So um, this was when we went to Ireland for Paul's 60th birthday. It was just the best time. We, um, that's happy hour. <laughs> this was our bucket list trip. And I'm just so grateful because the last night of the cruise, I sat and said to Paul's brother and sister, we won't be back. This is our last trip. There's something really, really wrong with my husband. The changes in Paul that Jennifer was noticing were because of an aggressive form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, or FTD. It was just little things. He just had an amazing sense of direction. And we were visiting a church one day, and he wanted to go left. And I knew that we had to go right. And it was just so out of character for him to not know what direction he needed to go in. A month after we got back from overseas, I said to him, I, we need to go to your doctor. I'm really concerned about some things that are wrong. And he didn't see it. Then I got given this big form that I had to fill out in front of my husband and I felt like a traitor because you had to rate whether he was better, the same or worse than a year ago. And I was ticking worse, 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 worse. I just knew that he was changing and that he didn't recognise that he was changing. And he said, I don't have dementia, there's nothing wrong with me. It took two years to get a diagnosis. Jennifer left her job to care for Paul. You just get to the stage where you're like, well, it's beyond what one person can do anymore and, and remain healthy yourself. After six months, she made a heartbreaking decision to move him out of their forever home and into a permanent care facility. I, I didn't like the way I was when I was being with him anymore. I, I was speaking to him out of frustration, not out of love. And I'd go to bed at night and just feel so awful about the way I'd spoken to him, you know? But you were just doing your best. Yeah, I was. But, you know, you step into... I felt that I stepped into treating him like a child. And I didn't want to. How often do you come up to see Paul? I visit him usually four times a week, sometimes five. Yeah, it's, it's not easy visiting. I don't find it easy. And what are your days with him like now? I don't think he mostly recognises me. Recently, he pointed to me and said to my daughter, I know that woman. So there was some recognition that he knew me, but not as his wife. How was today? He's good today. He was actually singing. I don't know if you heard him, but he was singing while we were walking. <laughs> you done with that? He threw his hat off. Yeah, he didn't want his hat. <laughs> This is his life now. You know, he's here all day, every day. So if I can get him out, even for a walk down the driveway like today, it just gives him something a little bit different. I still feel a little bit of guilt that I'm not with him, but I just have to trust that he's here and that they're doing their best for him. And I just have to trust, yeah, that he's okay. Janelle, where are we heading today? Today we're on our way to see a lovely couple who live on their own. They have both got uh, different degrees of dementia. They don't want to be separated, so it's really nice to be able to um, support them to stay living at home. So what kind of stuff do you do when you go in and visit them? Uh, we do crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> 
Make sure that they're eating and drinking properly. Do medication reminders, a little bit of companionship too. It's really nice for the family to know that there's somebody there keeping them safe. Janelle, who is a registered nurse, started her in-home care company several years ago. Hi, Pat. Oh, yes, Let's sir. have lunch. How are yeah. you? Do you prefer egg or chicken? Her 33 carers support 40 clients with different needs across Auckland, families paying out of pocket for the extra care. Well, we don't want to look at the houses for sale because you're oh, not moving, oh. are you? No. Nope. Everything's going yeah. real good. Well, I'm happy. I'm pleased. OK, so we're off to another place now. Is it important to help people with dementia stay in their home? A hundred percent. Familiarity is, is really important and can um, really have an effect on the progression of the dementia. I think we need to change the way we're looking at it and put more support into the community-based care. Like many families, Emma Jane tried to keep her mum Michelle at home for as long as possible. Having dinner together, is that something that the two of you would usually do now? Yeah, yeah, so we do that at least once a week. Oh, here we go. Turn it up. Down here, you silly thing. <laughs> um, we ended up buying this house so Mum could live with us. I always say the best thing is to keep her home. It was pretty much a case of carry on until we can't cope any longer. Emma sought some help by accessing the government funded in home care options. Some people were great, and lovely, others were, you could tell they're in a rush, um, and they've got you know, so many people to see and only so much time. Was there an option to pay for care out of your own pocket? There is, which is what we have been doing, basically. But there's only so much you can pay out of pocket, really. Right. But Michelle was diagnosed at just 58. She was able to live with Emma for a while, but has now moved into permanent care. It's an adjustment. I just wanted sort of as much as my normal life was, is now. So given her age, the options are quite limited. A 60-year-old shouldn't be living with 85-year-olds. She wants to be busy and active and involved and doing stuff, but that's not, not what the current system provides. How do you feel about being forced, really, to make that decision? I could, you know, quit my job and be a carer, which is what a lot of people have to do. Um, but I, I want to keep working and look after my kids and stuff like that. Um, but then knowing that mum's not really happy, I, I feel, yeah, I feel really guilty and I can't, can't find a solution. What have we got here? Because I'm seeing houses, not just one big building. So we have 13 houses. Everything happens in the house. The cooking happens in the house. The laundry happens in the house. Therese runs the Care Village in Rotorua. It focuses on helping residents participate in normal daily life. They even have their own supermarket. They must mm. feel like they still have a lot of their independence. Mm. And that's the idea, to encourage them to maintain some of the skills, like if they like peeling the potatoes, to peel the potatoes. It might take an hour or two to peel the potatoes, but it doesn't matter. We've got a hand mower because one of our residents, he likes to help out in the garden. So he's done the he, grass. He's done the grass. Six people live in a house like flatmates. Each home reflects a different Kiwi lifestyle. Which house are we in here? Um, so we're in Middle New Zealand. They've been hard-working people, you know, they attended sports fixtures, they were well involved in the schools. And do people go between houses? Yes, mm -hmm. trying to have shared barbecues, shared lunches, all that sort of stuff that you would do in a normal community. So what is this house, Therese? This is the formal classical living. They enjoy classical music, the classical arts. The wallpaper's different, the couches mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. The lighting. So it feels familiar to them. It feels familiar, right? looks familiar. Would you like to see this model throughout New Zealand? 
definitely. I think it is the future. I think it should be replicated. All the elderly have done is they've grown old and some of them have developed dementia. They haven't committed a crime and yet we put them in an institution, whereas this household model is much more like being at home. But for people who are at home, there are still ways for them to keep socially active. We've come to the Shirley Bunnings here in Christchurch today for a bit of DIY, but this DIY is going to be a little bit different because it's actually an activity class for people who have dementia. Nice, Tom. You going good? Yeah, it's going really good. Jeff, what are you doing here? Can I say I'm back out of the <laughs> You can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, I'm making a Christmas tree out why have you come to this class today? Because I always come to this class. I love it. The best prescription for dementia is, for the most part, not a medical one. It's a social one. And many people with dementia feel like they've maybe lost the purpose. And so coming along to something like this is purposeful. How long have you been coming to these classes, Phil? About a year now. Yep. Have a lot of fun. It's not too serious. Although there is no fix for dementia, there's certainly a fix for becoming isolated and probably what that means is that people delay perhaps going into care, remain in the community for a bit longer because they're engaged with the community they in. DIY is just one of the free activity classes put on by Dementia Canterbury. Starting art and craft this afternoon. Oh great, are oh, you on a busy day? More than 40% of dementias are potentially preventable if we intervene much earlier in the life cycle. If we look after our heart, if we keep physically active, if we stay stimulated with our brains, we can delay getting dementia or we can stop getting dementia. Yeah, get away from the TV, you know. All of these people today will go home with something to talk about tonight, about what they've done today, and having something concrete to show for that. They will love it. It's not uh, get a diagnosis, hang up your hat, get your affairs in order and wait to die. It's get on with your life, be it slightly differently. <laughs>